So thank you very much for coming. Um, first, I'd like to say that I'm really, really happy to be here, to be back to Gainesville, to be back to this university, to, to this program, where I learned so much and that I um, had the opportunity to experience so many things and know experience from all over the world. So it really improved uh, my professional ability as a protected area manager, so I'm really glad for that. And I'm really honored to be the RD of this such a special award. So I will show my research, my PhD research. So I already was a protected area manager for ECA, working for ECMB in Brazil. When I came here for the PhD, I already had like four years managing the major, uh, Middle Jura Extractive Reserve, which is another reserve. It's not this one. And I have observed during this time, and I was intrigued about how, what was the best way of managing these reserves? Uh, what should be the role of government? And what should be the role of communities in natural resource management? I was also curious why some communities were more able to develop, to, to manage resources sustainably than others. So these questions led me uh, to think about this topic and to develop it in, in my research. So I don't know if everybody in, in this room know about extractive reserves. Everybody? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, so the extractive reserves were an innovative model of protected area in Brazil that was created and conceived by the Robert Pepper social movement in the 90s. And it was different because different from the other protected areas that were created by the government and in general, they took out people from these areas. These reserves, they were conceived by the people and they were created to guarantee land rights for them and also to conserve natural resources uh, on which they depended upon. Um, and at that time, they conceived a mod model of self-management of this territory and uh, that would be collectively managed by the communities but in a way similar uh, similar as the indigenous tribes where the government concedes the land to the people but they have much more autonomy to manage resources so in 2000 in brazil we had uh, the national system of conservation units where the the structured reserves were institutionalized as protected as other protected areas. And this led to a shift from the self-management model to a co-managed mo model with the government. And so uh, two things, two innovations happened. So after 2000, these reserves that once were managed by the communities with only rules uh, made by them, built by them. Uh, now they will have to have a management plan that is made with local scientists. They consider local rules, but mostly they have the scientific input. And also, it created this forum, this deliberative council forum, that is like a, a, a decision making uh, board where they have to share. Uh, decision making with other actors, government, uh, NGOs, the private sector, but communities also have seats on this council. So this made um, the grassroots organizations uh, feel that they were disempowered by this, by this institutionalization. And also uh, researchers on extractive reserves also pointed out that they felt uh, that they really uh, were disempowered. So this was something that I wanted to look at. And so these new arrangements, the management plan and the deliberative council, they brought new challenges to the incorporation of local knowledge into the manage management and governance of natural resources in these areas, and also to ensure local participation in decision making. So the goal of my dissertation was to examine the share of authority in the co-management of the Brazilian Amazon extractive reserves 
uh, from the government to communities, and also uh, to understand the implications of it to natural resource management and conservation. So I was interested to look at why people engage in collective action for managing resources once they have uh, authority to do that, to, to decide upon resources, and also what, what um, factors lead to sustainable resource management. So I use the Pirarucu or Arapaima, that is the most famous common name, uh, management as case study. Uh, this is a very big fish that is endemic to the Brazilian Amazon, to the Brazil, to the Amazon, sorry. Not everything is Brazil, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, so this is the largest uh, scaled fish, freshwater fish in the world. It can, uh, can have up to three meters and 200 kilos, so it's a huge uh, fish. Uh, it's a large predator, predator. Uh, it has an interesting characteristic that it has to gulp air at regular intervals uh, at the surface. So uh, the more experienced fishers, they know how to recognize uh, this, these animals and differentiate individuals and those who are young by the size and those who are adults, sometimes males and females. So there is a lot of traditional ecological knowledge on the federal fishery. Uh, and based on that, they, and also there is another characteristic that this, the waters, the rivers in the Amazon, they fluctuate up to 12 meters from the uh, dry to the wet season. And the fish, they, uh, they follow these dynamics and they get, they remain in this, in these lakes when the waters are low. So they can be counted in the lakes. So uh, a scientist with uh, experienced fishermen, they developed a count method who showed to be accurate and was published, tested and published this method. And this gave uh, the basis for the government to set management quotas to the communities that were involved in managing and protecting those lakes. So this fish has a very high ecological, economic, and cultural value. So it's, uh, it was overfished in many areas. Some areas uh, suffered uh, local extinctions. And it was really depleted <coughs> before management being uh, implemented. After management, today in our days, we have uh, manage, management of Pirarucu in many places of the Brazilian Amazon and abroad in other countries as well. And we see after this management study that the populations really increased after that. Um, and it's considered by UCN Red List as data deficient because of this, um, there was depleted, but now it, it seems to be in a better position, better situation. So, uh, why I chose the Pirarucu management, I think you already can understand more, but uh, so this was an interesting case where many, it was a resource that was completely controlled by the government before management started, and the populations were low and depleted in most sites. And after people having management authority over this fishery, <laughs> they could, because this fish uh, is pro prohibited to be uh, extracted outside management areas all over the year in Amazonas, in some states, some uh, just on the reproductive um, time. time. Uh, so people could not uh, uh, legally fish, the populace, populations were depleted, but, and the government could not control it. And once it shifted to a more inclusive uh, approach, the populations started to really increase. And these animals are, uh, fishers say that these animals are uh, sensitive to disturbance. So if they follow the rules for protecting the lakes, the rules that they make to protect and govern these lakes, there is a, um, in general, that fish will be there because they feel that there is a safe place to be. Uh, 
also this uh, this is an ecosystem based approach because you do not you do not conserve and look only on the fish the fish is just one species that is protected once the whole system is protected by the communities so everybody's like a positive positive how do you say that win well, huh? win solution <laughs> yeah. um, and it requires a strong community governance so they really need to because there are a lot of big big boats large boats and uh, because there is a high value in the market so the boats come and if you don't have people uh, sitting there in front of the lake day and night or very frequently they will come and take out the fish from the community um, so, but there is, within the community, there is a chance that other members of the community do not follow the rules. There is the free riding, right? Uh, so they have to have trust and build norms and norms of reciprocity to, and, and there are, must have mechanisms to guarantee that everybody is uh, on the same page. Uh, so it's important to understand the, uh, how the social capital uh, what is its role in this process. So, uh, I used Ostrom's framework as the conceptual framework for my dissertation, uh, for, for analyzing social ecological systems. So, um, the sustainable pilarical management would be affected by the governments. Is there a contact? Okay. I can do that. Do you want to uh, from the governance arrangements, uh, the characteristics of the resource systems will affect the sustainability, characteristics of the resource units, the, of the pillar of itself, and of the users, the communities. So, in my research question, number one, I wanted to examine the uh, okay. uh, the extent that co management, the government co management, shared of management authority to communities and how it affected for the broader uh, resources in extractive reserves. You'll be okay? Yeah, I'm just a bit okay. of <laughs> uh, And how it affected the share of authority affects through compliance for all resources, not only here. Then I focus on Pirarucu, that is the case where the, there is, in fact, that communities have management authority to examine why people participate, thank you, why people engage in collective action for managing, management of Pirarucu. So I would like to understand the role of social capital on building collective, strengthening collective action for Pirarucu management. Uh, and then the third question, I would like to look at a broader picture and examine how this, all these uh, factors come into play to understand why some communities do better in management and with time populations go up and why other communities with time the populations just drop. It's not moving. Not even for Ah, there is something open here. Okay. There we go. So here are my research questions. I'm not gonna read. It's in my dissertation. <laughs> I just talked about them. <laughs> so I hypothesize that for the first question, that co management regimes involve little sharing of authority from SMEDU to communities in natural resource governance, and that communities were more engaged in complying with groups once they participate in management decisions. For the second question, I expected that the communities with higher social capital would present higher engagement in political management, would participate more, more. and that for the third question, it was impossible so many factors to raise. There are so many hypotheses that were, and factors that were raised by, compiled by Agrawal. 
that affect the sustainability of the systems of the resource management. So I conducted my research on the Lower Jurua Extractive Reserve, the Central West Brazilian Amazon, Amazonian state. So the reserve borders the Jurua town with nearly 10,000 people. And there are uh, 15 <coughs> villages, communities in the reserve. They are former rubber tappers. Um, and there are so the reserve was created in 2001. It has 188,000 hectares of forest, uh, where live nearly 650 people and 130 families. Their, their livelihoods are based mostly on subsistence agriculture, fishing, forest extractivism, and a small animal husbandry. The reserve is managed by the SMEB, that is the federal government, with the association that is representing the communities, that is ASCRUJ. So, Piraracu management was started in 2006 in the reserve in the six areas. So, I'm going to show. So, this is Botafogo, with these systems of lakes. Antonina, I don't know if you can see this mm -hmm. red. Uh, and then it's very interesting because this area, the Planeta complex, there's no one, no one living in this area. So representatives, leaders of these two communities, they decided that this had a lot of potential, although there were only 20 Pirarucus on the, on the first count, or previously, on the, it was not the official count, but there was very little uh, number, very few Pirarucus in the system because it's very close to town where the urban fishers um, used to fish, so it's an open, it was an open access region. And, but they decided to collectively uh, join, a, can I say, they, they bought um, floating houses to guard these systems day and night since 2005. So it's much better guarded than even their community areas and I will show what happened afterwards. <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, so, and there is like a system of more than 10 lakes. It's a, a huge area, but very, very difficult to monitor because there are entrances from the flooded forest all around. The flooded forest is all this um, orange and the green is the open forest. So it's very easy to have access from all these points. So in the other places, so this is the Bashir Lake. It's a very close to the community, very easy to monitor. The Sokol Lake, Sokol Lake also, it involves managers from these two communities, Sokol, Porto das Graças. And also the, the sixth is the Angira River. It's a very different management area. They manage the whole river where you have entrance, it borders the reserve, so people can enter to access other places. So it's a very hard place to monitor, to effectively um, protect the populations. And it involves eight communities in the management of this area, so it's a much more complex. So I collected both uh, quantitative and qualitative data from April 2012, a long time ago, to May 2013. And I developed both uh, quantitative descriptive analysis and qualitative analysis. Um, so for my first question, I examined the degree of shared rights uh, using Schlegler and Ostrom's framework, where they see varies from no a share of decision making, where you have only access and withdrawal rights to the right to sell the resources and decide how these rights will be transferred to others. So you and you have management and exclusion uh, as intermediary activities. So it varies from no right, no share, no right to full rights. Uh, and I examine it for various levels on the ground, there yeah, on the communities, 
on the management plan of the reserve and also on the deliberative council and for the various types of resource use. So land use, agriculture, fishing, uh, non-timber, forest products, timber, again, animals and turtles. And I collected secondary data from the deliberative council meetings, from the management plan, and I developed focus groups at seven communities. My research was focused on the communities that also managed directly. So in seven communities, and also I participated on three meetings of the deliberative council while I was there in July. So for the second question, I operationalize the collective action in, in pedagogical management as the frequency of people in the community, the, of the household heads that participated in management, and this was my dependent variable. And as independent variables, I had many uh, personal characteristics, social and political engagement, but I not, it was more descriptive. Uh, so the interest was to show how social capital affected. So I used Putnam um, definition that encompasses networks, norms, and trusts. And I asked, asked people, why did they join Mutirão for agriculture? So what is that? Mutirão is a very common collective work where families get together in the community. This is not obligatory, so they go if they want. And, and but it's a very, ancient, not, not ancient, but it's a traditional habit that they have. It's the moment that they get together, that they talk, that, where they exchange information, and they um, help each other on agriculture. And for the social capital, I, um, I, had a, I analyzed people's responses and identified Oops, sorry. So, uh, indicators of cooperation, trust, reciprocity, solidarity, and collectivity, social cohesion of the community. And I conduct interviews, semi structured interviews with 59 household heads. And finally, for the third question, also secondary data from the management plan and from the Pirarupu counting report since 2006. Um, and I conducted semi-structured interviews with random samples of community members of these seven communities, seven communities, no, six communities. And I conducted also participatory mapping, field measurements. I looked at satellite images to see the area of these lakes, um, community meetings, participant observation of the counting, fishing, and all the process of the political management and also informal conversations. And for the third question, I conducted a comparative case study analysis where I compared the communities with increased or decreased abundance through time. So I was not comparing how they developed one with the other, but how, to, how they increase over time their own management system. Uh, and I, this was my dependent variable. And I compared with multiple factors of resource systems, users, governance, and interactions among us using Austrian sociological systems. So, the main, my main findings. For the first question, I saw that uh, communities have many rules and identify many rules. Some, uh, most of them, which is the red, red color. Uh, most of them uh, were incorporated or in the management plan or were created with the government on the meetings of the management plan. Uh, some were laws, national laws, so they were, they are imposed. Um, and also they have differences. Some resources are more re regulated than others. And I also saw for that rules in which communities participate, mm -hmm. whether even with the government, that they have full compliance to these rules, comparing to rules when there's no 
community participation. And the opposite is true. So you have more lack of compliance when for governmental rules uh, laws. So uh, there is a limited share of rights to communities in these areas because they have a uh, few management uh, rights. They cannot sell, but they, they could be more involved in management of other resources and deciding, have more decision making power. For example, in the case of timber, there is very controlled by the government. And in the case of uh, turtles as well. So, and that decentralization operates in different ways for different resources. So some resources are easily to be managed, there are less rules, and others are very strict, especially those that have high ecological impact, such as uh, large-scale timber management, or um, whatever. <laughs> whatever was going to say. Um, when people participate in rulemaking, there is higher compliance with rules also. So for the second question, where I examine the role of social capital in collective action, uh, I saw that high participation in Terarupo management in these communities, Bashi, Montomina, Planeta, and Botafogo, and in the other communities from the bottom, I don't know if you remember the map, Soko and Angela, and less participation in Terarupo management. And I saw that the social capital index very in the similar in the same way where you have more uh, higher social capital uh, and less social capital in these areas. So I also examined and asked people why did they engage in Mutirão and why did they engage in theoretical management and comparing those answers responses. So for Mutirão, for agriculture, uh, they have the human relations, they appear much more stronger, stronger than utilitarian <laughs> motivations. So for example, many people said that participated in this agriculture uh, collective work because there is a sense of collectivity, they, they were, uh, they wanted to be solidarious. Solidary to with another, with each other. So the English is bad. Uh, and also because they felt that if they helped, they would receive help uh, in the, when they needed. So these norms of reciprocity, solidarity, and collectivity were really important for Mutirão for agriculture. And some people also said that ah, because it's easy, it's faster when you have more people working with you. But it's it's a completely different uh, picture when you look at theoretical management. You have, you still have the human relations that's really important for the collective action for managing theoretical. So the sense of collectivity also appears, but you have much more people saying about the utilitarian motivations that make them engage in it. So income and also natural resource conservation, because once they protect the Pinarupu stocks, they are also protecting other fisheries that are important for the livelihoods. So it's not only about money, it's also about their subsistence. So then comparing these uh, for multiroids, the first for agriculture, you see much more human relations as important for engagement than utilitarian reasons, and for theoretical management, the human relations, they appear and are important, but the utilitarian reasons were much more frequently seated. So I found uh, a positive relation between community social capital and collective action for theoretical management, and the multiple motivations for those. And finally, on the third, uh, for the third question, um, as you can see, as in other places in the Amazon, when you hear the management systems in order, Botafogo in order in the map, Botafogo, Antonina, ah no, sorry, it's not in order. 
I don't remember how I organized it. <laughs> but it's organized, yeah. So, Botafogo, Antonina, by Shia Lake, Sokol Lake, and Planeta, and Angira. So, if you see this photo here, you see that through time, from 2006 to 2012, looking at the overall abundance, scalar abundance in the reserve, <coughs> it increased from 1,300 uh, pilarupus to 4,500, uh, 4, sorry, <laughs> six years later. So it's uh, almost three times increase. Um, and when you compare, so it was really hard, uh, even knows about that. I was like crazy two years looking. It took me eight years to do the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a detail. <laughs> um, so I was really two years in this chapter because it was really a lot of data. So if you can simplify it, just simplify it. It's easier. <laughs> um, so I decided to, so it's really complex to see patterns because there are so many things going on. But if you look at the overall, they all, comparing the last and the first year of management, they all had increases. This is the proportional increase, as you can see. But here, Planeta Complex had a high increase. So almost 600% in six years. That is the area that people decided really to, to, to care about, to, to take care, to protect. Um, and the Soko Lake is one community that is the hugest community in the reserve. There is a lot of uh, conflicts inside, so the, the community is divided. Some are Protestants, others are Catholics. And there are also other things going on. Uh, some people really are opposed to manage, management. So they said that once it started and they were, they didn't agree, they decided that they had also the right to fish, but they, they fish outside of the management. So all these conflicts just increased through time. So you can see really how the Pirarupus in this place, they dropped each year. 200, 137, 98, 60, and 40. So on the other years, so these years, they decided not to fish anymore, just to protect the lake, not fish, to see if the populations would increase. So what I did, I compared, to make it more simple, the analysis, I compared the two extreme cases of the Soko Lake, where it decreased abundance, and the Planeta, with very increased abundance. And so looking at all multiple indicators that I analyzed, I could see, I don't show here because there are so many tables, um, that I could see the, the indicators that really show the difference between the increased <coughs> and decreased abundance systems is within co-management, uh, the fact that they can participate in decision making. So in the SOCO community, they have just people there are members of the association of the community can participate in meetings where they change the rules. So not everybody is allowed to participate and modify the rules in the community. Uh, where in the Planeta context, everybody participates in all, in all meetings and all uh, opportunities to build and to change this rules. Uh, also, I saw that monitoring is really important. Because this is the only place, the Planeta Complex, when people really are engaged in protection. As I said, they are there day and night for Christmas, for New Year's Eve, for birthday, doesn't matter. So every manager, group of managers stay for a week, and they, they rotate. So they, they come back like on the other month. Um, and different from the Soko Lake, where they don't go, they, uh, they fish in this lake for subsistence. And they don't, um, they only see that people invaded and took out the fish uh, when they see the past tracks uh, of people from outside. And then they, oh, somebody took, st stole our fish, but they do anything to change it. 
Uh, also, mechanisms for conflict resolution, where it's, it's all in accord with Ostrom's theory, and supportive external institutions. So, SMEBU and well, Astruge were really supportive in this case. So, Astruge was the association that decided to, um, to have financial, a bank financial, confession, lower. Sorry. A bank lower to buy the, the, the floating, two floating houses in 2005 without any government support. So they decided by themselves because they believed that it was really key. Um, just, this is just an example. There were more. So also um, the community has a strong leadership. It's really important to buy the group, to motivate the group in the good direction. Uh, social capital, we saw that it's very important for keeping the, the community together, the group together. Uh, and also, different from the literature that points out that heterogeneity in the group is important for sustainability, I found the opposite, that the more homogeneous group, the Planeta complex, was more successful than the group that was very heterogeneous, with different interests from that management system. Uh, also, Fisher's ecological knowledge was key for the sustainability of periodical management because they, they knew that if they protected the lake, they knew how periodical behaved, so they knew that it was effective. So that was the, one of the main reasons why they decided to, to engage on that. So also here, the predictability of periodical, of the resource, and this also this rapid ecological response of the fish. Because if they stay there for 20 years protected, maybe they don't feel so motivated as they were in this fishery. Uh, in the, and also the aquatic systems. I found that uh, also the predictability of the systems help so that they know that once they protect, uh, they, the fish will come back and there's very big lakes will support more fish. Um, also, the system that, that systems with high storage capacity will help more fish, of course. So, the, my main conclusions, very general conclusions, um, that under co-management, the state decentralizes few rights to communities, uh, but that governance, community governance, is key for resource conservation, as I just showed. And once people have rights to manage resources, they, they can, not everybody, but a lot of communities can do it really well, improve local governance, and be more, engage more in rule compliance. And, for instance, rule compliance resulting in better conservation. Uh, so my research has theoretical implications for these fields of the common property theory, for co-management, social capital, and also it brings um, some practical implications of showing that how community participation is really key for people complying with rules. So you cannot only impose regulations. You have to have people really participating and giving their uh, voice. If not, it, it won't work. Um, and that both communities and government have responsibilities to make for management work. Not only the government and not only the communities. And um, that the same decentralization that man of management rights that Peter Rupo had, then giving more power to people to manage, it could be held with, for example, for turtles. Because people in the Amazon, they protect these, these beaches where the turtles is found. And spawning beaches, nesting beaches. Huh? Nesting beaches. Nesting beaches. Um, so they protect it from decay since the 80s, and they cannot. Uh, so it's really a hard work because they stay there in the sun at night and uh, with all the different difficult conditions. But they still do that, and they they hope that in the future they can be able to manage and to sell. But Turtles are protected by law, and they cannot be sold. So what you see from uh, from many protected areas in the Amazon, there is a lot of people taking out 
legally uh, for the illegal traffic of turtles that is a very has a very cultural value and economic value one turtle big turtle is like um $250 for here is not that much, but for Brazil, I mean, it's a lot, new guys mm -hmm. yeah, or more. Um, so what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, I believe that once communities, at, at least they should have the experimental management uh, power, uh, experience that they could show, uh, they could show my son. Uh, once they have more powers to decide and maybe sell one part of the eggs or one part of the turtles with uh, with uh, government authorization and monitoring, that I think that the turtle populations would be much better, would be much better than they are now. So you create incentives for people to protect. So thank you very much. I would like to thank the university, the, the School of Natural Resources for all the support, uh, this wonderful program, the <laughs> Conservation <laughs> Development Program, uh, IAF, the Conservation Leadership Program, National Science Foundation, London Pets Moore, ICMEBIO for letting me be here for four years, uh, the reserve, people in the Reserving Association, and all the communities that receive me so well and are always so open to, to receive us and to ask all those boring, annoying questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really thankful. And I really want to give special thanks to Stephen that was really patient and supportive, like a father, really, really <laughs> nice advisor, really good advisor. But not old, right, Stephen? Not like yeah, a father. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a brother. <laughs> uh, Mary and Chinique also was always very, very supportive. Since the beginning, when I came here as a visiting scholar, she received me and advised me for six months before the PhD. And Brian Child also was very inspiring in his classes and talks. Maria Legretti, I had the pleasure to have her. They, in my committee. Uh, I also thank Betty for directing this wonderful program and all the support, Patricia, also amazing. Uh, and all those friends, the view, the communities, the, com the community became my family, really. I don't need to need more details. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my mom, so highly supportive, my son that waited so long, my family here, people from the association here, the Gator community, and here from the White House. Because I knew the White House, I read the Times. So thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here and to see the, the work.